I remember my brother showed me my my first fight, which is Evander Holyfield uh, against Lennox Lewis, the second fight. I, I was just hooked from then, and I've always liked a good fight. I've always liked to train, cast myself as like a kind of historian. Like I wanna, I wanna learn as much as I can. I really enjoy like the the tactical side of things, like the chess match that is. I need to kind of make a go with this. However, whatever angle I approach uh, boxing, I need to try and do something with it. So like probably about four or five years ago, I started my own page. I just started as a bit of a hobby and it kind of grew and it grew and it grew. You know what they say, if if, if you in, truly enjoy your job, like it, it's never work, is it? If you want to do it that bad, if you want to do anything like that bad, just do it. Just do it. It doesn't matter what anybody says, just go and do it. it doesn't matter. It's, it, media's like a cruel business, man. It's whatever gets kind of views and whatever gets people kind of interested in reading. Welcome back to the CoachCast podcast. My guest today is an interview for one of the biggest boxing YouTube channels out there at the moment, Behind the Gloves. Welcome, Gaz Singh. How are you doing? I'm all right, bro. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Um, as you might know, like the way I try to start each podcast is sort of talk about your cultural upbringing, background and, and things like that. Just a bit of context on on uh, who you are and what sort of background you come from. Um, yeah, so basically, I'm, I'm I'm Sikh. I grew up around West London, so like around South or Greenford, Hounslow, the kind of sides. Um, it was kind of a, just a traditional upbringing, I guess. And my parents were away a lot, um, like working on their businesses and stuff when when I was quite young. So I was raised by like my grandmother, like most Asian kids are. She picked me up, school, dropped me off. I was raised by my older brother and my older sister, and uh, I just had a, a, quite a normal childhood. Um, in terms of like my teenage years, uh, it's hard growing up, man. Like I, like I said, my parents were away and stuff, so you end up. Me personally, I ended up getting involved with kind of like the wrong crowd, and it was um, not. I did. I ended up doing stuff that I wasn't proud of and whatnot, and going to places I wasn't proud of. But you, you kind of grow out of that, don't you? And you, and it's just a phase. Well, most of the time, it's just a phase, and then you, you become an adolescent and then an adult, and and uh, yeah. Yeah, you live and you learn, definitely. I feel like uh, you, you hit the nail on the head there with a lot of Asian parents, like obviously having uh, their own businesses or just working uh, relentlessly. I guess we, we get, I guess it's a good stereotype, isn't it, is, is the work ethic that we'll have, <laughs> one of the good ones. Yeah, the work ethic, especially, I think that's that's really important, man, because you see a lot of, like, a, and I don't want to like, put this in a way that's going to sound like uh, racist or like downplaying anyone, but... It's, it's like, especially around here, you see all the corner shops and a lot of businesses are owned by mainly Asian people that have come from whatever country they've come from. And they've put in a lot of effort to to financially set themselves up, like support people back at home, for whatever country they're from, and then support their children here and stuff. It like makes me think, like, if my parents grew up here and were born here, what could they have done with themselves with, like, from being zero to what the age they're at now? instead of just coming, like my parents came here in the late seventies. So they only really had like, I don't know, like it's been like, oh, it's been a long time now. It's been like 50 years. That, like, <laughs> not, but the first part of 20, 30 years of their life was back in India. So, I mean, if they had that first 20, 30 years here, like, I would have loved to see how high they could have gone and what they could have accomplished, especially with the drive and that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. hundred percent. Like, I think that's the thing that people don't under, uh, maybe might not, conceive properly is like the, the people that are coming over here aren't coming because they've got a good life back in India do you know what I mean it's it's because they're coming to actually make something out of themselves and then fortunately I think a, a lot of the second generation like uh, like myself and yourself um, hopefully we do pick up on the the work ethic and the sort of sacrifices that have to be made obviously it isn't for everybody isn't that way some people do sort of it goes over the head and, the, and they take the privileges and just move on but fortunately like I think a lot of people do obviously sort of go back into the roots ask the mum and dad questions see how hard it was and get that sort of gratitude for them and then can, can apply that in their lives forward I think that's that's kind of that would that would what you just described there was me where you know we just take everything for granted and you just you grow up and you have like not like a lot of money but you have enough to go out with your friends you have enough to mm -hmm kind of buy your first car and do stuff like that for me personally it's quite late it's late on in life like I only discovered that for me like <clears throat> so I'm 30 now and probably about five years ago when I was like kind of 25 I thought you know what I need to build on what my what my parents had done for me here 
So when I have children, they have more kind of, I use the word wealth loosely, but they have more at their disposal than what I did. Mm -hmm. I mean, so then now they, they'll have more and they'll have opportunities to take a further step from how far I got it. But no, definitely, I was, I was that kid, man, like growing up, early 20s. Yeah. It just kind of goes completely over your head, doesn't it? And you don't, <laughs> really, don't really think about what's, what's happened before. It's just something I think you kind of gauge with time and as you get older and stuff. 100%. Well, is it, similarly to me, so I'm 24 now and I, I've probably made that sort of shift or uh, maybe more so within the past couple of years myself. Um, obviously, I think when you're at school and things like you don't really think about anything else other than when the next exam is or whatever or going out and playing footy with your mates afterwards. But obviously, I think when you sort of get to later life and, and maybe out of the education system or when you're starting your job and, and actually like trying to build something for the future is that when you look back and think flipping out imagine having to do this coming yeah. from another country <laughs> yeah, it's, it's amazing thing for it? it's, it's a hard job it's not easy like trying to come from a different country not speaking a word of english and trying to accomplish and make something for your life for your kids and your brothers and sisters and everything it's mad it's crazy when you think about it sit there and think about it properly it's, it's, it's insane i could yeah. i could yeah. migrate to Spain now and learn another language and <laughs> have a job and open up a business and stuff like Dad, taking a long, long time. Exactly. Um, sort of touching on a, a boxing and how you got into that. So, like, obviously, as I said at the beginning, it, you work for Behind the Gloves, which is one of the biggest uh, boxing channels out there. Um, how did how did that come about? So, I, I imagine that before you even like obviously got into that job, you probably liked boxing growing up and things as well. Yeah. So I loosely followed boxing. Like since since I was like nine, eight, nine years old, I remember my brother showed me my my first fight, which is a Vander Holyfield uh, against Lennox Lewis, the second fight. That was back in 1999, so it was a long time ago. And um, I, I was just hooked from then. Mm -hmm. I was just hooked from then. I, I fought as, like I said, I was kind of in the wrong crowd when I was younger and stuff. So I liked fighting and stuff like that. And I, I had a few, I got into a lot of trouble and ended up moving up north, like towards Birmingham and Coventry. And I had a few amateur fights and I was at a boxing gym for a little while. Um, and I and I wanted to kind of progress uh, into, into actually being a fighter, but stuff happened in my life. And I, I came back to London and yeah, my life kind of, kind of took a different route. But um, in terms of boxing, I've always been into it, man. I've always liked a good fight. I've always liked to train with the boxing stuff. I've every, like I try and, Try and like cast myself as like a kind of historian. Like I wanna, I wanna learn as much as I can. I'm learning about new fighters every day, like past fighters, bygone fighters that would have fought there. I, I've never, I've never seen fight live or that they're retired now or that they've passed away. Like last night, I was watching um, Azuma Nelson against uh, Jeff Fenich. I don't know if you know who they are, but uh, Azuma Nelson was a legend in himself, and Jeff Fenich was as well. He was. He was from Australia. He won a world title in his seventh fight, and he was a three-time world champion. And it wasn't that long ago. It was like back in the early 90s, 80s. Oh, like okay. A lot of forgotten fighters and stuff. Yeah. So I try and read up about stuff. I've always been interested in like, the way people do their camps and how kind of fights play out and stuff. Because a lot of people see boxing as just two guys just going in there and just beating the shit out of each other. And... <laughs> You know what I mean, it's like some, hoping for a knockout and stuff. But I really enjoy like the the tactical side of things, like the chess match that it is, because it is it's a, it is when they call it science, it's art. Boxing is art. You know what I mean, it's all based on you don't just go there and anybody can have a 50 50 fight if you're just winging away punches. But the movement, the head movement, the body movement, the footwork, the the angles that the punches come at, the speed that the punches come at. Um, the way you move, the the size of the ring, your entrance, the business behind it, like the business behind it, really interests me. Like, just just like to, it's not like like a, a mainstream sport in like in England. They, they don't, it doesn't get funded and stuff. I know like the GB squad does, but like like you, there's no. You, you see, with like football, you get approached by scouts and stuff, and you get that onto youth teams, and you get like turn kind of semi pro, and they put you on like their B. Like they kind of be a uh, setup that they've got, and then you can eventually go through the ranks. There's nothing like that with boxing. If you're an amateur boxer, everybody goes through the um, like the English boxing sort of amateur circuit. And if you're good enough, you make it. And if you're not, you don't. It's only that one percent of boxers that make it to like like big time. And when I say big time, I don't even mean millions. That's like like 
having a steady paycheck was like over 100 grand or something like this that's not even big people don't think people just think it's like blitz and glamour and stuff like it's yeah. like less than 0.5 percent fighters like you get like mayweather or tyson or just complete special people that kind of earn kind of millions like that's not it's not, it's not billions in, in, in floyd's case or yeah. a billion <laughs> yeah if yeah. Do, do you think like them sort of names going back to what you said before about them fighters being like uh like forgotten fighters in the 90s do you think there's because of the names of like you mike tyson's during that era that a lot of fighters will will get forgotten so for example um it, within the heavyweight crop now there's like for example lewis ortiz is, is a is a really good fighter boogeyman all of that banter but with the tyson fury Anthony joshua's john Wilder's in 20 30 years time do you think people are going to remember lewis ortiz or they're just going to be talking about whoever wins this little uh, triangle. Do you think that's also like a thing? So like you have your Muhammad Ali's before that, you have your Sugar Ray Leonard's. There'll be like a crop before that, but do you think it's just whoever's at the top is the one who get remembered and then the rest sort of get forgotten? That's an interesting question. I like that question. Um, in the 80s, it was kind of it, more for, more fighters were forgotten because it wasn't social media. You know what I mean? So it's really, so the only way you were going to get exposure was through like a, a TV deal. YouTube didn't exist. Yeah. There was no Instagram. There was no Facebook. There was no streaming platforms. It was just TV, and that's it. And if you weren't good enough to be on TV, you'd be forgotten. Um, it's a bit harder to forget fighters now, so because everything's online. Like even like I watched a fight last night, and it was online because someone uploaded it. But um, I don't think Luis Ortiz would be forgotten. Like I can't speak from like a like a casual kind of point of view because I'm into boxing a lot. In 30 mm-hmm. years time, I'll personally still remember him. Because he has, he's 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 a good heavyweight. He's fought some good names. He's got some good wins. He's only lost to Wilder. Um, I guess so. Like in in the grand scheme of things, maybe not forgotten is the right word, but not spoken about is the other one. Like people yeah. know who he is. Mm-hmm. Like you'll still know who he is in twenty years time. It's not really bringing him up, but you won't go to a friend and just start talking about him. You'll yeah. go to a friend and start talking about, oh, do you remember Tyson Fury? Do you remember Dionne Wilder? Do you remember Anthony Joshua? That's what you're saying. Nobody starts a conversation with, do you remember Lewis Ortiz? And I don't mean that in a bad way. You know what I mean, like, he has his own fan base and stuff. Like, mm-hmm. I'm a fan of most fighters. I'm a fan of his fighters. But he's just... And the other thing is, like, he's very inactive at the moment. I don't, I don't know what he's doing, whether he's going to come back or he's going to retire and stuff. But so, well, There's that joke that nobody knows what his real age is as well. Yeah, so you, you never know when he's going to retire. <laughs> if you live the life, age doesn't really matter, though, does it? It's just it's mm-hmm. just one of those things. Like, Klitschko fought, what, Joshua, when he was, like, 42 or something, 41? Yeah, yeah. Floyd again lives a life. Don't drink, don't smoke, don't don't party, nothing like that. Just just trains, just trains, eats good food, travels around the world. Even Golovkin, like you don't drink, nothing like that. Just trains, chills out, goes play like beach volleyball and stuff like that. Stuff that doesn't, it's not too taxing on a body. Golovkin head. arguably was in his best shape in his in his last fight. What was his name? Uh, Meta, I think I can't know how to pronounce his name. I think he's Polish or something. What are you talking about? But I'm not gonna. Yeah, I'm not gonna try to pronounce. <laughs> yeah, it. yeah, it's like some F C Z banner. It was a Polish chef. I know what you're talking about. Yeah, but it, it, I, I don't. So to answer your question, I don't think he'll be forgotten. I just don't think he'll be at the tip of people's tongues when they want to talk about it in 20 years time. Yeah, maybe I use the wrong word. It isn't forgotten, but I think that that is sort of what I meant. It's like like lesser lesser known, and then they sort of dwindle out of people's like on the tip of their tongue. Whereas when you go back and you think of like Muhammad Ali, for example, or Mike Tyson, maybe the winner of this Tyson Fury Anthony Joshua fight will be regarded in in them terms or like spoken about as highly as them. Whereas say somebody who's perhaps between five to ten on the Ring magazine rankings probably wouldn't be spoken about uh, as frequently. Um, you remember, like, so Muhammad Ali was a lot of people know him globally, not because of boxing, but because of what he did outside the ring, like not going to fight in a war, like um, fighting for oppressed Muslims, fight, fighting for being a black man and having equal rights. Yeah. And you have like, Tyson, which was he was, yeah, he was a member of his fighting, but a lot of people remember from some of the crazy shit that he did. <laughs> you know I mean, like buying a tiger as a pet and like getting into street fights and punching promoters and all the stuff that went on with Don King, which was more publicized in the media because it gets media is like a cruel business man it's whatever gets kind of views and whatever gets people kind of interested in a reading and if you punching some random geezer in the face is more attractive than you knocking someone out in the ring then that's they're not going to publish the thing about you knocking someone out in the ring they're going to publish what got you in trouble and it's going to give you a lawsuit 
and Floyd created this whole um you gotta be undefeated to make it. You know what I mean? You gotta be you have to protect that own. So they each had their own thing that made them great. You know what I mean? So it, and, and you'll see it in people like Tyson Fury's might be he was out of the ring for three years and he went through some crazy shit. Um and it, that's what people might remember, like he got positive for cocaine and like there was a ton of stuff going on. And the um, mental health issues. I think that that's uh, it's not a nice thing to say, but I think that is probably one of the things that was in his profile more than anything else. Obviously, it's not a good thing to say because you went through the mental health suffering that you did, but fortunately you came out the other side. But when he wrote his book and he did like the, the pandemic lockdown workouts and he's a massive advocate for, for mental health on that side of things, it is something that people will remember going forward more than perhaps how the, the first Wilder fight, for example, because uh, in the books, it's a draw, whereas that stuff is like, uh, that, that stuff will last that people. links to casual people. So if you didn't know boxing and you saw mm-hmm. someone advocating and like spreading good kind of like mana around uh, mental health, you'd, you'd get attracted to that, wouldn't you? If you're struggling yeah. with something and you don't watch boxing and you see a guy who's, oh, I was depressed and I use this and I use that to kind of get out of it, it voices for you more because you, because you, you're going through it yourself or you know somebody that's going through it, not necessarily him being a boxer. But you'd have to see, man. You kind of remember people for different things after they're gone. It's kind of hard now to justify what they're going to be remembered for because the career isn't finished. And the next fight might be something amazing. You never know. Yeah, very true. Talking about the sort of media side of things and like uh, basically, I think clickbait is a good way it would because it's obviously banded around a lot and... I get hooked into a lot of these uh, boxing videos on YouTube and there's a, there's a lot of clickbait going around. Uh, so going back to basically how you got into behind the gloves. So you, you were into boxing. Did you, did you do anything before behind the gloves so in terms of boxing, I guess, journalism? I don't know what the, the right, is that the right term? Yeah, it's journalism, I guess, media and journalism. But no, I, w- I wasn't really interested. I was just, I was just a massive fan. And I think, like I said earlier, like it was kind of, I started taking life seriously and thought, I need to make something of this. If it's something I really enjoy, I need to kind of make a go with this. However, whatever angle I approach mm-hmm. uh, boxing, I need to try and do something with it because I was, it's what I'm passionate. I don't watch football. I don't watch rugby. I don't do none of that. I just, I, w- I watch combat sports. Like I love that stuff. Um, so like probably about four or five years ago, I started my own page kind of blue corner boxing. And I, I, I at the beginning it was kind of just a hobby. And I, I, I would just update the news. Um, and it kind of grew, like I talked to my friends and I saw what other people were doing and stuff. So I kind of, I thought, you know, what, I'm going to make a real go of this. Like, I, yeah, I've got no journalism kind of experience. I've got no media experience and stuff, but I, I don't really have any experience doing that. But you never know, like the wildest things have happened to people. Like most, I'm not saying for a minute that I'm going to be a billionaire or a millionaire or anything like that. But the people who have um, like these big businesses and they, they've accomplished a lot with their lives and stuff at one point were maybe sleeping on a park bench. Like they had no qualifications in regards to what they're now doing. And it's the same with me. Like I, don't, I didn't have no qualifications in media or journalism or anything like that. So I just started as a bit of a hobby and it kind of grew and it grew and it grew. I reached out to fighters myself, whether that was via email or uh, sending them a DM or trying to get their numbers and stuff. Like you'd be surprised how many phone numbers there are online for people, like important people and links and stuff. Uh, I'm not going to say any more about that, but yeah. I can't give my secret away and then people are going to start doing it. Like, really gonna do it. But yeah, no, I reached out to Behind the Gloves. Like, it was just an absolute kind of coincidence. Um, they were literally just about to post an advert um, looking for another member of staff. And I, my stars must have been aligned or whatever. Like I've spoken to a few prior to working for Behind the Gloves. Like I spoke to Connor Ben, his dad, uh, Anthony Fowler, like just on a casual basis, like on on Instagram Live and stuff, and mm-hmm. Abe Colwell and a few other a few other people trying to get my name out there, and um, so I contacted Behind the Gloves and I said I'm I've I've been doing this for four or five years. It was just a whim kind of message, like uh, do you guys kind of provide like trials or opportunities for people to to to, to kind of try out and. Uh, out of the blue, I didn't think they were going to respond because basically we're behind the gloves. Like they had a page and for whatever reason it got shut down. Like someone must have reported it for something stupid or something, but it had like well over a hundred thousand followers or whatnot. And then they had to start again. Cause I remember when they recycled it and it was down to like 3000 or something. And we've only just reached up to about 80,000 now, but whilst the levels were low, I think 
is when I like kind of started following their page and I knew who Michelle was. Um, I knew that like the other chap who kind of works for Full Ad was. I knew I I'd obviously watched their interviews. Like, I'm a big boxing fan, so I watched a lot of media stuff, a lot of stuff at IFL, a lot of stuff at Behind the Clubs, Seconds Out, all that type of stuff. So I reached out and um, they responded and they kind of asked for like a resume, like what I kind of do for a day job and the kind of detail that I speak to speaking to people is a part of my job so I'm not lacking confidence um they wanted to know if I've had any exposure on tv which I have and if I've had any other kind of media stuff and whatnot so they gave me kind of like a trial um I did a couple of interviews I don't it's really bad I should remember who I interviewed first but I don't <laughs> I'll, have look, I'll have to look back so I did a couple of interviews I got sent to a Hennessy event um it, it was the event where Sam Eggington was fighting Ashley Fiafane in the main event um so yeah I, I showed dedication like i spent probably about two grand just over two grand on camera equipment um kind of showing that look i'm, I'm dedicated that kind of give me a go uh the trial like i said was for about a month went to an event did a couple of interviews and uh they liked what they they kind of saw uh prior to that like uh they, they asked for a phone number and uh, michelle gave me a call we had we had a chat on the phone um about like me wanting to kind of work for them and what the work entailed, sent over a contract, signed it. And it's it's been pretty good, man. Like I've I've learned so many skills from them that I never had. Like I know how to edit movies, I know how to make money from YouTube, like getting mm -hmm. access to speak to not necessarily all the way all the time through behind the gloves, but through my own page as well. Like having having Michelle behind you. So if I if I reach out to say, I don't know, anyone, Joe Joyce or Daniel Dubois or Tyson Fury or whatever, and they don't respond, I can go to Michelle and she has like their personal phone numbers and stuff like she gets what she's friends with these people. So if if they're if they're free, then I could do those kind of interviews and stuff like being able to go to like one of my colleagues, he, he was at the Dillian White fight week. Um that I've, I've been to Hennessy fight weeks, MTK fight weeks. Um they've slowed down for me because a lot of stuff abroad at the moment. Um but yeah, it's it's that's kind of, it was just on a whim really. And then here we are now. Kind of it's I'm I'm still I'm still learning. Like I'm still uh I don't know what the best way to put it is. Continuously improving. Yeah, yeah. So that's 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 one way of putting it. I'm never gonna be perfect, but building like a, my own contact kind of base and I've reached out to like other people and stuff because I thought initially like I don't want to give plans away too much but I wanted to start like my my own kind of media business not now but like maybe in four or five years time and kind of progress as behind the gloves iPhone and all the other companies have and kind of create uh, my own online platform to do interviews and stuff but I've kind of taken a different angle on it now and I've started to teach myself other things to get kind of into boxing and stuff so like I'm I'm learning how to wrap hands and stuff so you can get okay. like a, sec a seconds license from the british boxing board of control i've been getting a lot of advice from a, a fellow called michael who wraps dillian white's hands um and th th there's other stuff as well man like i put myself on like a physio course um and, and go through the levels of learning all of that yeah. so i, I want to try and cover all angles like because i, I want to be heavily involved like i want to i want to do it full time mm -hmm. but yeah that's kind of my story so far in terms of like working for behind the gloves and the media side of things, so you just you just love boxing. You just want to be be involved any way that you can, basically, from the sounds of it. Yeah, cause you know what they say: if 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 you in truly enjoy your job, like it, it's never work, is it? Like I, I, if I could do interviews for a living, or if I could go and be in a fighter's corner and be in their camp and stuff, like I wouldn't wake up in the morning thinking, "Oh God, I have to go to work." You know mm -hmm. what I mean, you just get up and kind of go. And I'd like to think there's not a lot of people, however many people might say it to you, there's not a lot of people that are doing what they actually want to do. Do you know what I mean? I think it's the, the definitely the minority because, um, I, I, well, as you've alluded to that, like even, uh, I don't want to be putting words in your mouth, but even now you're not doing this full time? No, no, I'm not doing this full time, no. So like, but the ambition is to finally like sort of transition out of whatever you are doing as, a, as like a yeah, full time yeah. job into, into it. So, and I think that's what, uh, like, even that I think is the minority of people because a lot of people wouldn't even be wanting to sort of set the foundations for them to transition into what they actually like. They'll just be like stuck in the, in the job that they want they're, they're in because of financial necessity. They're yeah. not actually wanting to make that transition. Some people will be in that transition mode, but 
Um, I don't even think a lot of people would, would, would be doing that. Do you know what I mean? Because it takes balls to do that as well because you sort of, the time management, I imagine that like uh, you'll be having to schedule your time a lot more strictly because of that as well. Like if you've got a full-time job and you're doing this on the side, it takes a lot of dedication as you've already mentioned. It's, it's like, um, it's just popped into my mind now. Like you've got Maxi Hughes. Uh, he, he's he's an MTK fighter. He's had, besides from the Hennessy events, he's a, he's had four fights in lockdown and like he's won he's won the wbc international lightweight title he's a british lightweight champion but even him he's still a builder he still goes to work monday to friday yeah like, he trains afterwards like he's a builder by trade like a plasterer or a de- decorator or i don't want to insult him like i don't i don't know exactly what he does but if you follow him on social media you'll see his stories and you'll see the pictures that he puts up and he's there in his fluorescent jacket dirty clothes hard helmet yeah. like bathroom walls and building walls and stuff and that's a champion that's someone who could get paid a lot of money fighting on tv like money that you can live off of but he's mm-hmm. at the moment he still has to go to work to get me so it's i think there's a lot of it's boxing is that kind of sport it's not it's all glamorous in terms of like the social media side of things and um have seen your name up in lights and stuff but 80 like percent of fighters at least or around that region still have other jobs because it's yeah. not well, it's prize fighting at the end of the day. It's like you have to market yourself correctly. Like for, for example, him. For example, if he's a champion, like it, it, he should sort of be marketed correctly that he wouldn't have to be doing that. But then other fighters who perhaps might not be as highly skilled or or at that ranking who have marketed themselves probably. Uh, I don't want to. I don't want to say better because it's probably disrespectful to him. So, uh, but but you know, like differently that they can sort of keep that. Uh, keep it full time like again i don't i don't want to fire shots at anybody but dave allen for example he's, he's not exactly the best fighter in the world uh he, he had a good run but he had like this marketability this cult-like following and he ended up headlining a pay-per-view with derek chisora on his undercard do you know what i mean like which shouldn't really happen but he's made a sort of full-time thing out of it but uh, and maybe the skill level doesn't reflect that whereas if you go into another division I'd probably argue that he may be even out in someone like Inoue, who is um, an unbelievable fighter, one of the pound for pound best in the world, sort of thing. But it's, again, it's that marketability. It's it, that's the, I think that's the weird thing about say combat sports, not just boxing, but also like UFC, for example. Which I do want to touch on that a tiny bit later on. But compared to say something like team sports, like football or basketball, where there is a league structure, the higher you go in that league more likely you will be paid more whereas that doesn't always translate in boxing it does 99 percent of the time i mean most of the champions will be higher paid than say so people rank lower than them but obviously not always it's kind of where you started your career like mentioning maxi there he turned pro like 12 years ago mm. i mean like boxing didn't have youtube didn't have Instagram didn't have like these platforms. So the kids coming through now, someone who's three and oh, might have a bigger following just because they they marketed themselves, right? I don't I don't want to put pressure on like kind of the people that the managers and the, the promotional companies that look after these uh fighters because they do an amazing job. Like all the MTK kind of fighters, they they're so well looked after, like mm-hmm. in terms of finances, in terms of press, in terms of getting interviews in terms of getting coverage for their fights and getting their names put out there. For me personally, MTK in the UK is probably the best place to be because you can be with Matchroom, but then you won't ever fight a Frank Warren fire and vice versa. You could be with Frank Warren, but you won't fight a Matchroom fire just because mm-hmm. there's like different channels and TV deals and all this stuff like that. It never hardly ever ends up happening. We've seen a couple recently, but in the most part, like nine times out of ten, it won't happen. I was just going to say, but, you said that on the week that we've got back-to-back weeks when, yeah, when it's happening. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I know you've had, um, obviously, Liam Williams and Andrade, and now you've got Bentley against uh, against Cash. But that, that that's rare, though. That's mm-hmm, very rare. Is, yeah. But the thing with MTK is they're right down the middle. Like If you were a sign with MTK, you can buy a matchroom cards, you can find MTK cards, you can find Frank Warren cards. But uh, is that because they're, they're a management company, not a promotional outfit? Uh, they are a manager, managerial company as well as an advisory outfit as well as a promotional company. They probably don't call themselves a promotional company, but they put fights on. They put yeah, fights true. together. And to be fair, like if you ever look at the viewing figures when they have like a Friday or a Saturday night fight card on, they have more people watching than that you could fit in a York Hall or that you could fit in a Copper Box arena. 
mm-hmm. like the copper box arena like the the kind of some fight nights are like just mad because the copper box arena you can fit eight thousand people in there there's like twelve thousand people watching the show online so like yeah. They, they they are capable. They're more than capable. And they have they have some of the best fighters in the world. They manage Tyson Fury, Billy Joe Saunders, Charlie Edwards. Like there's a ton of fighters I'm going to miss out, but there's tons of them. Like loads and loads of them. Loads of US champions. They're breaking the market everywhere. They've got promotional kind of like firms and uh, well, they're putting on fights like in Mexico, Croatia, all over the shop. Mm-hmm. And and they're like kind of branching out into the amateur game. Like it's such a good company. Like. If you're in the boxing world, you won't hear it, uh, any anyone say anything bad about that company because all they do is give and give. They don't take anything. They just give opportunities. They give fighters a chance. They're just giving and giving, and giving and giving. It's great. It's great for the sport. And I think you did see that like recently with obviously when there's Tyson Fury, Anthony Joshua Dio happened, and and uh, I think what's his name, Daniel Kinnaham, is that his name? Uh, and all, all the like panorama stuff came out about him. I think most of the boxing like world i guess so those fighters promoters anyone who's basically dealt with mtk basically backed back them to the hill which i guess is is probably like a backing up what you're saying as well like if everybody who you work with basically has a, a glowing and positive review about you it pretty much it, you do know i mean you represent your reputation sort of uh, speaks for itself it is because uh, the mtk event that i've been to and speaking to like lee and like even uh, I barely message him, but the few times I have, and when I've spoken to him in person, like the entire team up there, just it's like when you meet them, it's like you've known them for ages type thing because mm-hmm. there's none of that kind of awkward silence or anything like that. They're just straight into it, very polite, tell you what you need to know, and they just have a good time type thing. Like it'd be different if you're going somewhere and people are like sighing at you and the media guy is not very nice and people are too busy to talk to you and stuff like that, then you might have a bit of a negative impression, but they're all just down to earth. It's like you go there and I, it's not even like a, you wouldn't think it's a business because they still get on really well together and it's more like just a bunch of friends hanging out, playing boxing on. It's great. It's a great atmosphere anyway. I've never like, uh, went to like an MTK show, personally met Lee, but he did actually reach out uh, on social media to us after the in the bus he interview went out. So, uh, and obviously we've talked about that as well. And uh, honestly, like, such a nice guy. He, he he was um he was just really nice and just had really good words to say, uh and and like this is somebody who's who's I've never spoken to the guy before. I've never met him or anything. And he's just like yeah. After that interview, he was like oh yeah, you, you, you it, what you're doing is really good and and basically just had positive words to say. Um, obviously, uh, Ender Basi is obviously also signed with MTK as well. And uh, when we've been speaking. Or, or through like DMs and things, we've obviously spoken about uh, Inder and, and Gully and, and a few other uh, Indian boxes and things. Is that um, something that you sort of keep a closer eye on because of obviously being up and out yourself? Uh, I guess so. Like, not what I want to accomplish in the future. Like, you can't be biased because mm-hmm. at the end of the day, boxing is quite revealing in terms of what, what kind of what kind of person you are and what, whether you've got what it takes, it doesn't matter whether you're black, you're white, you're brown, whatever. Yeah. If you're good enough, you're good enough. And that is as simple as that. Um, but yeah, no, I, I would say that I, I, I speak to both these guys that you just mentioned. And I, I think, I think, I think they'll both do well. I mean, I think they'll, 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 they'll both do very well. It is interesting. Cause obviously like in a, in a South Asian perspective as a whole, um, Pakistani British boxers are very, revered in British boxing history. The, the two that shout out, obviously, Amir Khan and Nassim Hamad, do you know what I mean? Like, it, it there's, doesn't seem like there's that much of a barrier if there was, like, a, a new Pakistani-British uh, boxer, like, a, a breakthrough start. It would be the, the this uh, path to success is already sort of laid out. And it's interesting because although <laughs> Punjab and India are very closely uh, sort of geographically situated to Pakistan, we haven't really seen anybody, like, do the same from like an Indian background and and obviously as as I, we're talking both from a Sikh background I'll, I'll say openly biased as a Sikh uh, Sikh boxers obviously in that is professional we've seen Tao Singh who's just signed with Amir Khan uh, and obviously Gully uh, uh, that we've we, we mentioned before um, but it, it seems why, why do you think there is that difference if like obviously you're not gonna have all the answers but just your your opinion on, on why that that might be the case I think you hit the nail on the head there with 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 Pakistani boxes that are coming kind of through and like there's a lot of them don't get me like Adam Azim and Shabazz Masood and stuff there's, there's there's loads of them coming through and they're a lot of them can go on to accomplish good things but like you said the path's been set out like 
Nas came along and there's never going to be another Nas. There's no one going to be ever as flamboyant. There's no going to have, no one have the skill set that he's got. Um, and I don't personally think like, can you say he set out the path? Because I haven't seen anybody even attempt to do what he did in the ring at all, in the slightest, in no way, shape or form. But then moving <laughs> on kind of, I feel, because then if that was the case, between Amir Khan and uh, Naz, you would have had other um, British-born Pakistani fighters or Pakistani fighters come through. I think since Amir Khan has gone, like, credit where credit's due, like, he's at the age of 17, he went and he won. Uh, that's like, that's still like a, that's... That's still like a youth kind of thing because they say you've got to be 18 to fight in the seniors, like if you fight in national tournaments or international world championships or whatever. But to the age of 17, to beat grown men and win a silver medal, um, and then however Khan's performed recently, whatever that's down to him, like stepping up weight divisions and fighting people, and he's, he's stringed together quite a few losses now. But early on in his career, he was a conventional boxer, he was fast. He fought with his hands up. He had good footwork. He had good head work, good head movement, sorry, good body movement. And I think he's the one that kind of laid out the path um, for other like kind of British born Pakistani um, people to kind of come through because there's a lot of people that kind of box similar to how he boxed, like quite elusive, um, a lot of straight shots, very quick. Um, I think he was the main catalyst in then having an opportunity. And in terms of up and fighters, like you said, there's there's no one that's kind of laid out a path for like a, a, a Sikh fighter or a Hindu fighter or whatever from that kind of region. But then I also think it's kind of down to us and our faults because at the end of the day, you've got no role model to look up to. Do you get me? Like Indabasi yeah. came through. Who is he looking up to? That's that kind of, that's kind of Sikh and that's done that before him. Uh, Gali still an amateur. He's still got many years in the amateurs. But who's he looking up to really? If you if you're looking at it from that perspective of being an up and out stuff, they, they, there's no one to look up to, is there? Yeah, this you... is what I mean. Like setting out that path to success is, is sometimes it just takes that person at the top, not like mimicking how they operate as a boxer, but just saying, like, it, so for example, if there's a young Pakistani lad and there's a young Indian lad, uh, and they both want to get into boxing, it's very much like easier for that Pakistani lad to have some sort of hope and aspiration, or even convince his parents to be like. <laughs> you know I mean? like, look, I want to be like Amir Khan. I want to be like uh, Prince Nassim. Whereas that Indian lad's going to be like, I want to do boxing. The mum will just look around, but like, like who? Do you know what I mean? Like who, who you want to emulate? Who who has actually made something of this that you can sort of... And let's be honest, like we're all about money, really. Dumb. So if it's like, right, boxing or doctor, lawyer, engineer, if you, if you ain't showing somebody like a world champ or someone who's living off boxing, then it's going to be doctor, lawyer, engineer, stay in school or, or, or whatever it is. I am being very stereotypical here, but it is sort of the things that will likely happen. In terms of, yeah, that kind of to what you just said, um, like, I think people should carve out their own paths. It's as simple as that. I don't see it as, it's like I said at the beginning of this kind of segment, that it doesn't matter whether you're black, you're white, you're brown. If you've got the skills, you'll make it. Because eventually the skills will shine through and there will be the, the promoters out there, the TV c uh, companies out there will have no choice but to put you on. Do you get what I mean? Obviously it helps at the beginning if you've got like promotional backing from someone. Mm -hmm. But I think it's very much like if you're, if you're, the only thing lacking is if you've got like an up now, if he's, he's, he's from Punjab or Sikh Hindu, whatever, and then you've got a guy who's from Pakistan or whatever. But I, I, I still think the race is the same. Because when you turn pro, especially, everyone starts with a zero. You know what I mean? If the guy, mm -hmm. if 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 the, if the Pakistani guy do, does better than better than the others, then he's the one that's going to get the deal, and vice versa. You know what I mean? They're, those are the kind of the people that get the most interest shown onto them. Isn't it? You, you, are you going to watch a guy who's gone to five straight points victories or five straight knockouts? Like, it's, it's 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 that simple, isn't it? This uh, is true, but I think like, uh, and I don't want it to sound like competitive because I know like obviously when it comes to, like cricket, Pakistan and India have like a heated rivalry. I, I'm just using the example as um, as because they're the closest probably to us as in uh, ethnic wise. Uh, and obviously there's, there's the disparity in boxing, but I think it actually goes to the, the point earlier, which is where I slightly disagree with you here is where, when we were saying like the marketability of like say Dave Allen versus Inoue. And that's not whoever's better will get more money sort of thing or will be pushed more because it's just not the case. 
Do you know what I mean? So like if there is somebody from a background which has got a already strong uh, fan base, like boxing fan base, compared to one where there's untapped potential, which I believe like the Indian market is because every other sport's trying to get into India, football, basketball, whatever, but for some reason boxing isn't. Um, and I th- feel like if you are guaranteed the, the Pakistani fan base or take a risk on the Indian fan base, which one are you going to go for? It's, it's like, what what do they say? It's like the rabbit in your hand versus two in the hedge or, or whatever that phrase is, uh, which is where I would, I, I would slightly disagree with you just on that point, because I feel like there is a lot of untapped potential in that market but it just takes you, you couple to to do the executing as well. Do you know what I mean? I think the execution is regardless because if you if you can you can have like a string of losses and you're just never going to go anywhere, even with as much promotional backing as uh, as you want. But I feel like that opportunity might not be the same um, in terms of like maybe just the stereotypes that already are, are, are in the game. But I don't know if I'm seeing it from a very skewed perspective because. Uh, I, I don't know. Uh, like, I'm not like the most hardcore boxing fan. Yes, I, I really like it. I'm probably above casual, but I'm not hardcore. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? I'm like in that middle ground. But you know, you know what the thing is? Is you're talking about like marketability and stuff. I think to a certain degree, you can't compare Dave Allen in any way because in Japan, in terms of their boxing, it's very closed circuit. Mm-hmm. Like, there's, just, there's, there's a lot of Japanese fighters fighting Japanese fighters. And a new way he's done, he's like a three weight, four weight world division champion, but he's only been picked up by top rank like recently. Mm-hmm. And let's be fair, the major promotional companies operate out of England and America. And that is it. Uh, you, could, I, you couldn't tell me who the Russian, Russian Federation champion is in any weight division. I guarantee you can tell me. Yeah, I mean, who the Croatian Federation or national champion is as a professional right now in any weight division. You couldn't tell me. You couldn't tell me who the German one was. You couldn't tell me who the Chinese one is. You couldn't tell me who the new, the one in New Zealand. You couldn't. But, but if, but you know who the, like, I would say you know who, who's most likely going to be. I bet you can at least name one British champion. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. Uh, if you go across to America, they've got so many versions of titles, like the NABA, the NABF, and stuff. You can name me like one guy in one weight division who's nationally known. Do you get what I mean? Mm-hmm. So I think the comparison between Dave Allen and like, the pulling power behind Matrim and Eddie Hearn is the biggest in the world. Do you get what I mean? And top rank, unfortunately, in my opinion, is actually, you know what? I'm not going to say that because I still talk to the media guys. So I'm not going to say that, but it's, it's just not on the same level. Like it's, it's, it's completely different. And in terms of untapped potential, like there's been a few Indian boxers that like, got Virginder Singh who... I don't know what happened to him. He won. Yeah, he, I've seen that as well. Like like the Mad. super middleweight title, and then he disappeared. Uh, and you had like um, Sanjeev Sahota as well, who's like 10 and 0, eight knockouts, signed to Frank Warren. He was doing amazing. And then, I don't know, his visa ran out or something, and then he, he, he never fought again. Or there might have been some other issue, and he just never fought again. Um, but in terms of untapped potential, England is the best place to do it. We're such a tiny country, and the opposition is just. Like you could fit England into America like fucking a thousand times over. Like you could fit England into India like a million times over. Like these countries are massive. England is so small. And sometimes it's not even about looking up to well, sometimes it's just about a brave parent. Like don't get me wrong, like if when I have kids and he's at 15 years old, I'd like to think in 15 years' time my contacts in boxing have gone through the roof and I can push him towards fighting. And if he ever wanted to do it, we could actually make a good deal of going through and trying to win a world title or something like that. Those are my aspirations, like my long-term kind of aspirations. But England's a perfect place to do it. And sometimes you just got to be ballsy enough to carve your own path. Like, excuse my language, but fuck looking up to someone and and and, and kind of thinking this is this is what I want to be. Or, yeah, there's a path laid out for me. But like, like in the, about, he needs to carve his own path. Forget about fucking losses and wins and what that shit, all that stuff, he just needs to carve. And even when Gully turns over, he's got a lot of experience as a youth amateur at the moment and he's transitioning into the seniors and stuff. Um, he just, he, again, like you tap to him and like, the drive is just, like he's got massive drive, like training every day and stuff. And I, I think he can make it personally, but he's got to carve his own path. But I want to say just one thing is, in terms of, if you forget about this kind of, like the culture stuff for a minute, it's there's a lot of, I don't want to say boxing is a dirty business. It's all about who you know, man. 
you couldn't turn over pro tomorrow have with zero contacts and me you could be the best fighter in the world like legitimately the best fighter in the world and if you've made no contacts you ain't you ain't making nothing about him if you don't know someone that knows someone or you 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 can't get like a leg up skills yeah they can they they can they can make you shine but they might make you shine like six years down the line after you've had 20 fights 30 fights 40 fights by that time you're past your prime like boxers have 10 years max especially in the lower weight divisions it's not like being a heavyweight you can fight to you're 41 you're 42 you don't have to cut weight but then like if someone turns over when they're 22 out of low the weight division like featherweight or super featherweight by the time they get to 30 32 the next batch are going to come through and they're all they're all of a sudden going to find that they're slow as shit and then they don't they don't move as quick as they used to move or punch as fast as they used to do you know what i mean but uh, I, it's all about who you know and having balls enough to carve your own path. You know I mean, I, th- I think that's that's. If, if I was to send a message to anyone that wants to try and boss in, just carve your own path. Fuck everyone else. Like, do do your own thing. Like fight your own way. Have your own heart. But take it seriously. It's as simple as that. Your parent, my parents might not support you. Other people might not support you. You might not get supported because of your culture and stuff like. But yeah, you know I mean, like just just do it. If you want to do it that bad, if you want to do anything in life that bad, just do it. Just do it. It doesn't matter what anybody says. Just go and do it. It doesn't matter whether you start when I did, like when I was 25, five years ago. I think I started 10 years too late. You know I mean, if I go back and tell myself something, anything, it would be start when you were 15 instead of 25. You know I mean, I'd be 15 years ahead of the game then instead of four or five. I'd be in a much better position. I would have accomplished a lot more. And like he said, it's all about money and it. I would have made a lot more money. <laughs> it would have been in a, in, a, in a better place. But you know what I mean, you just kind of... You, you, you just, if you want to do anything, whether you're Pakistani, Sikh, Hindu, white, black, whatever, just go and do it, man. And just carve your own path. Don't worry about other people's paths and stuff. Because and, you know, and, and I couldn't agree more. It, but it does take the balls that you you were saying. Like it does take a ballsy parent, or it does take, uh, and it takes that one person that makes it a lot easier for everybody else. Like using Ender as the example because he's probably the the uh, at the moment probably the most promising I, I, I'd say and I'm probably biased in that because I've spoke to him a few times now but he's um he's trying to get talent as well he's um he's uh he'll he'll make because you know what he's he's I think he's making his debut at flyweight super flyweight man the the, the pool is shallow for shallow for those low weights mm-hmm. especially domestically and European uh, you jump up to world level like, look at Sonny Edwards he's about to fight uh Maruti for the title next week and he's only 14 fight deep 13 fights deep yeah, and even for the British title was like a couple of fights ago. I mean, the, the pool is so shallow. I mean, if you're at a lower weight class, you've got a much better chance of winning the world title. And to be fair with Tal as well, like obviously being uh, linked with Amir Khan, being on the TV show, all of that stuff, like uh, it, it's a lot of publicity as well. So um, it, for him, that's obviously good going forward. But um, a po- point that I was going to, sorry, make when you were speaking about Top Frank before and, and you sort of caught yourself before you said anything, is that something that you find hard to sort of be? Um, impartial because I, in the sort of business that you're in of, of interviewing all these fighters, I imagine that you can't really give your own opinion just because you don't want to sit break barriers or uh, not break barriers, burn bridges is probably the, the better term. Is that something that's uh, difficult for you? It's just something I'm kind of learning on the job because if you if you ever look back at like if you go on Michelle's like Instagram, if you watch her videos and stuff, like people are always asking for predictions. People are always saying to her, like, what do you think of this? Whatever. And she, her response for years has been, I can't say I don't give predictions. I can't say I'm kind of learning the hard way because I'm a fan at the end of the day, and I like some fighters more than I like other fighters. But in terms of like, yes, yeah, exactly. I don't want to burn bridges, and I don't want to seem biased. I want to. I want to be impartial because at the end of the day, like, it's I'm a fan of the sport at the end of it. You know what I mean, and not even the individual people. Yeah, I got my favorite fighters and stuff, but. Like I'm a fan of the sport and I want it to thrive and I don't want to burn bridges. I don't want, it's hard though, isn't it? Because if, if you don't know behind the gloves, go check us out on like social media, YouTube or whatever. Sorry for the plug. Um, go for it. <laughs> like it's, it's a massive following. Like last thing I want to do is piss a fire off, piss his fans off. And we, we lose thousands of followers. Like that, that hits everything in there. I mean, I get told off, I make less money. I'm, it, it all affects you, doesn't it? Uh, so yeah, I I try and stay impartial when it kind of comes to things. I have my own opinions. I have like really strong opinions on certain things, but I don't need to speak to like my close friends about it. Really, you know, when my family members or whatnot, I won't I won't go out and publicly put those opinions out. You know what I mean, I might have the odd joke in that, like I put something funny on my 
Instagram that I thought was funny the other day on my story, I think it was yesterday, but uh, if that's just a joke that everyone wants to know and then I might say something like that. But the amount of times that like, I'll go through like Instagram and stuff, like when I'm on the official page or my own page and I see comments that just really, really piss me off and I just want to say stuff, but I don't. Just because like, you're affili affiliated with such a bigger brand, and they don't think you, they think that the brand's mm -hmm. got that opinion and that's not what I want. You know what I mean? So, yeah, it's tough to remain impartial sometimes. I think, so, do, do you not think like sometimes it would come out anyway, like sort of your biases? Because like, say for example, if you, out of a hundred interviews that you've done, 10 of them are with one person compared to like the other 90 being with different people. Or do you know what I mean? Like it, you can sort of tell which which sort of interview is like, as, as we said before talking uh, on uh, through Instagram, I'm a, I'm a bit of a fan of IFL. That's like my go-to. And I, I so obviously watch seconds out and, and yourselves as well. Uh, but if I'm like watching one more than the other, it's probably IFL. And you can tell which fighters, for example, Coogan is closer with. It's like the Billy Joes. He doesn't really hide away from it, the, the Tony Bellews and the Dillian White sort of thing. You can very much tell that he's got like a, uh, and even the Dave Allens. Uh, and you can tell he's got like a, a bit more of an affinity to them fighters compared to others, even though he does remain biased. Uh, uh, not biased, unbiased, sorry. Um, but d so do you think that like maybe it could sort of creeps in in that side of things or you very much like try to be on top of everything? I, I do, to be fair, you know, what? I've never spoken to Coogan and whatnot. Yeah, I haven't. I've not, I've not met him. I don't know the guy. But at the end of the day, I can imagine... He tries to remain as impartial as possible. But you know when you're becoming friends with these people? Mm -hmm. You know when you're spending so much that like he would have spent years and years and years around Billy Joe and Dillian and all these people. He would have spent like, at least 10 years around all these people. If you're spending that much time around someone, you they're going to be your friend to a degree. You know what I mean? So it's going to be... I don't want to say it's not going to be hard for him to remain impartial, but you you, you get more a bit more emotional towards it. You have a bit more of a you feel some type of way about it. Like, you know what I mean? Like, I, can't, I can't say that about any fighter at the moment because I've not been doing this long, like be touching a year or whatever, like on a professional platform. But I can I can see how it would be difficult. Like I know, honestly, I don't want to say that either. I'm, <laughs> like, I'm, I know Michelle's like close to Tyson Fury. But you won't ever say, you won't ever turn, hear her say that. She might say it in private. I don't know. I'm not, I don't want to question what she does in her private life, but she might say it amongst her friends, like predictions and stuff, but she'll never turn around and like, say, oh, Tyson Fury will beat Joshua or whatever, because I know they're really close friends, but just for being unbiased. Like, Coogan will never come out and say, like, oh, yeah, I think this person's going to absolutely spank that person. Might have an opinion on it, like a heartfelt opinion or whatever, but uh, that it, it's you've got to. There's no, there's no two ways about it. You've got to remain impartial. Yeah, you know I mean, because some people get sensitive, innit? Like some people do get sensitive, and some people get. Again, I don't want to speak about no in particular fires, but people get like, like. They'll not come back on the platform because you've said that they no, might lose. They put themselves on like a high platform, then don't they? And yeah, you know I mean, if they they think that they're God's gift to everything, and then if. If like, if you're not supporting them, it's kind of like, there's one fighter in mind, but I'm not going to say who it was. Maybe <laughs> recording, I'll tell you who it is. But like, it's it, like, if you're not with them, like even if you've got something neutral to say, if you're not with them, you might as well just not like, do have any have anything to do with them. But I, th I feel like that is um, sort of competitors in general. Like, uh, it isn't, like there is that sort of, egotistical nature and I, I guess they have to be to an extent because if they don't believe they're going to win then there's no point in competing so they probably do have to feel like they're God's gift on earth to to sort of get to the levels that they they want to get to and I don't think that's a bad thing going to um sort of the the big three that we already mentioned as yourselves at, uh, behind the gloves seconds out on IFL I feel like IFL is probably like one of the bigger ones in the UK but in America do you find that you you're sort of battling with seconds out to be like number one or number two or is that uh, i'm not sure if that's in terms of like subscribers and views and stuff like you'll see obviously you get like ifl they they, they they've got nearly a million subscribers so it doesn't matter what video they put up we've got just over a quarter of a million so it doesn't matter what video they put up they're going to get more views mm -hmm. than we've got just because they've got the numbers they've got the bigger numbers um obviously michelle started in america uh, she spent years and years and years grinding in America. So she has access to a lot of American fighters that IFL won't have access to. Uh, she can go, she, she, like they, 
interviewed, this is another chap on the team, he interviewed like Andy Ruiz, uh, Sugar Hill, he's at the charity event in Las Vegas with Tyson Fury. Uh, obviously, Michelle had a sit down with Tyson Fury. She was speaking to Jose Ramirez, who's a month up for fighting Josh Taylor, uh, Robert Garcia. Like, she's got access to all these American fighters that are on like, the West Coast and even the East Coast. Like, it's, so like, I'll tell you something you don't know. So all media has been, all British media has been banned from Canelo v. Saunders. Yeah, I heard that, yeah. Jesus, for whatever reason, I don't want to get in the ins and outs. But Michelle lives in America, so... You know what I mean? Like, there's not going to be IFL there. There's not going to be good views for them. It's just literally the only media platform there is going to be us. You know what I mean? So it kind of, yeah, you're you're always battling. It's I think it's you're in competition with yourself. You know what I mean? So we want to try new things and we want to outperform. Us, like yeah. we've been in the previous month, and you know, I want to get more views than I did on my last video. You get what I mean? I want to speak to a new fighter this month. So it's about improving myself. I don't really pay attention to that kind of. IFL's numbers or seconds out numbers and stuff like they're nice people like going to the Hennessy event like the uh, seconds out uh, people who do those events and they actually work in partnership with like Channel 5 so when Hennessy events and stuff are on so they do like face-offs between fighters and stuff they're all really nice everyone's just really nice like there's no you think like I can imagine going to an event and seeing like like Coogan there or someone you'd feel oh, kind of under a bit of pressure that you need to do well but it's not even that it's like if you need help with anything like it's very much like it's hard to be in competition with people who are really nice. You know what I mean? I know you've all got a job to do, but... I was going to say, because I feel like you do get that vibe, like, although that user is sort of doing the same, similar sort of thing, and, and you, there probably is that competition of very much seems like a friendly competition. Like, the videos that I've seen of, like, Michelle, uh, Radio Rahim and, and Coogan together, it is, it is very much like they've been through that sort of struggle period when nobody really give a shit about boxing youtube channels in the early days they've sort of built themselves up together so there is that sort of com camaraderie out of it i think that's the right word camaraderie right. probably said that wrong <laughs> um but going on to going on to numbers sorry because uh, uh, like obviously you, you sort of said their channel view numbers and things like that another big thing that happened on on the weekend that just passed was um Jake Paul versus Van Askren. <laughs> I've seen you, seen you mouth cringe there, your face cringe. But I, I, like, obviously, you said before you can't really give you opinions and predictions and things because of biasness and things. But so I'll, I'll open it up to like a broader question. Do you think these sort of crossover fights of entertainers fighting each other in the boxing ring are overall good for boxing in, in general? Yeah, I guess so. If you want to put it like that, yeah. In terms of hardcore boxing fans, I can see why they disagree with it. Um, but it's like anything. If Jake Paul wanted to, I don't know, shift towards like snooker or something, he could probably sell a million buys just playing snooker again, but, but against Ben Askren. Like, but if it's just boxing is a method that he has chosen um, to make to make money from, because yeah. there's a lot of entertainment behind it. It's it's still a real fight, but it's very it's very. I would like to say boxing is more like WWE than UFC is. You know what I mean? Because at the end of the day, you have like. Like Derek Chisora like spit in your face or chuck a table across the room or like like you have that type of stuff go on like uh, that I think the video that went round was when Ben Askren put his face in uh, put his hand in front of Jake's ass and everybody was just saying that he slapped him on the bum like that was just that's 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 that in itself it would circulated the planet and had millions and millions and millions of views it's just a method they've chosen to make money I guess and for the overall for, for overall in terms of boxing yeah i guess so because it might bring because his card had professional fighters on the undercard so people would have seen them that have never seen them before like regis progre and ivan reddick and stuff like that you would you would have seen those guys like, even steve cunningham like but there's i think this whole thriller thing is i don't know i don't know what their plan is and stuff but they seem to be making some big bids and getting some big fights and stuff so uh i guess so i guess so uh yeah it's bringing more eyes to boxing whether it's in a way or a bad way, they are. Yeah, I was having this conversation yesterday with one of my mates and he was like, what's the crack with this thriller thing? Do you think it's good or bad? And uh, at the moment, it does seem like a bit circusy. But if they do more fights like, say, Tia Fimo, where they've obviously like um, 
did, did a massive pace bid for that. Uh, and they do do more that sort of style and they incorporate this sort of entertainment sort of thing that they've got, like Justin Bieber apparently was on on the event. They've got Snoop Dogg commentating, Oscar De La Hoya, highest tits commentating <laughs> um, and all of that crack. I don't mind not being biased and he was fucking off his head. <laughs> um, but if they do sort of more of the Tio Fimo stuff and keep that entertaining, then maybe it is like the next generation of boxing. But I don't, I, I don't know. It's, uh, I think you sort of have to see more events that are purely boxing or more events that uh, have more boxing on them to understand what their intention is going forward. But it is a very weird one because, as you say, like um, the the KSI Logan one had Billy Joe Saunders on, had Devin yeah. Haney on. So it is like um, if it brings more eyeballs to the sport and then you can actually see real boxing at the same time, then it is, it is probably good. And the numbers these social media stars command is is ridiculous yeah it's more than most fighters so it would be silly not to but going on to like sort of the next sort of mini topic would be uh from ben Askren to the ufc and mma and uh you said you were a fan of combat sport in general so i imagine that you probably watch the ufc as well but do you think there's ever going to be a point where mma overtakes overtakes boxing That's a difficult question, man, because you kind of look at, I think, who was complaining? I think it was someone, I saw a post, basically, and they listed out what John Jones' last five fight purses were. Yeah. And they listed out what Canelo's last five kind of purses were. Yeah. And it's, it's a massive disparity, like millions and millions and millions of dollars. And I don't want to quote too much on like, the money side of things, because I, 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 I don't know. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not not that deep into it. I don't know how the money works. I don't know. Everyone's got different deals. You know what I mean? So like John Jones might pay his manager a certain amount, his advisor a certain amount, his trainer a certain amount. UFC might take a certain cut, but like Canelo's his own boss, isn't he? And mixed martial arts has only been mainstream, like not long. Like boxing has been around forever. It, was, it used to be called uh, pugilism. Like, that was the official name for boxing. It was just two gentlemen having a fight. Like, it's been, it's been about since like the early 1800s. Like boxing's been there for like forever. Like just a straight up fight, just punching someone, someone, it's always been there. And it's been about since like, like, it's some of the fighters' names have got kind of slipped my mind, but some of the, like going real far back, like Jack Johnson and Jack Dempsey and stuff like that. Like they were mainstream back then when like when when TVs were black and white, like UFC <laughs> went about then, mixed martial arts went about then. And I think as UFC kind of progresses, give it another 10 years or whatever, um it it might kind of make it to 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 that kind of that kind of viewing. But you look at people like Canelo and stuff and like so the UFC, right? So they have a television contract with ESPN and they and BT Sports and stuff, and they that's where their revenue comes from. So you'll have like Canelo, who's sponsored by like Hennessy. Hennessy will give him X amount of money. Well, AJ's a better example, Lucas Aid, Under Armour, Hugo Boss, like these massive companies that are paying a shit ton of bulk powders, shit ton of money. Uh, obviously, people because he's an Olympian, people watch him all the way around. And DAZN's a bigger platform, it just is like it is. It, DAZN is in every country now. Yeah, I mean, yeah. it's horses in most countries as well. Um, but that, this is just me making calculated guesses. I don't know too much about how Dana White gives out his purses or what he what's taken into account when 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 he's obviously kind of it's got to be fair, right? Like it can't be unfair. Like it's only recently that fighters have been kind of complaining about it. Like I don't think I've no every fighter complains about money. You yeah, but I, mean? I feel like for the for the UFC, it's, it is a, is a bit more like obviously the comparisons between boxing and and MMA is uh, a bit different, but the, I had this conversation on one of my first podcasts with uh, an MMA fighter from New York. And uh, similarly to yourself, he said like boxing is always going to be bigger because when the UFC was first introduced in the early 2000s over there, uh, or when it was first become a popular, people like literally in New York were like, the fuck, they, get, they kick each other. Like They should only use hands because that's boxing, it's fighting. But I also feel like boxing had this transition perhaps when uh, Don King was managing Mike Tyson, where Don King was the king. Do you know what I mean? He had the most, most of the fighters, he would be pitting them against each other uh, so so that he would get obviously all the like management promotion fees and he would be taking most of that. You, you like say Mike Tyson got screwed out of how many millions of pounds, like uh, uh, different figures are bounded around all the time. 
But Dana White's in that situation now where a lot of the fighters, uh, a few of the fighters, that the higher sort of end fighters at like John Jones, sort of rebelling against that, saying this it's not proportionate to our star power, how much we're getting paid. So I feel like if they come out of this transition, and there's there's a good thing and a bad thing to this. The bad thing is, is that you get to the boxing stage of you have X amount of governing bodies. Uh, and so there's that many titles where you don't really know who the proper top dog is. Uh, and then you get different organizations. Like I'm not a fan of the WBC franchise title. I think it's a load of bullshit. Do you know what I mean? If you're going to have a world title, don't upgrade somebody so they're untouchable. But like the UFC made this BMF title just as out, out of nowhere. Do you know what I mean? It's, it's that sort of like, Con- like a-, a controversy maybe I don't know is the right word but you have pride you have glory you have I think one championship already in MMA there is already a few different governing bodies and people can go from one to another for extra pay and so I feel like that the-, the UFC's stronghold might be diminishing in the long term because of this uh, pay dispute but that's just my perspective uh, uh, and it could be very different to a lot of people this is what makes boxing interesting though, isn't it if you uh, if you have you're going to tune in. You, most people, like if you're a casual fan, you're going to tune in to watch Canelo against Saunders because in your mind, the media and these companies have made you believe that they are two world champions and you don't know who is a better one. Yeah. A lot of people will say Canelo, obviously, but they'll be out there who think it's Billy Joe Saunders. And if it was a lesser fighter in terms of caliber than Canelo, you'd think it's a 50-50 fight. It might not be a 50-50 fight. One might... One, fight might just be an absolute badass and the other one is just a sack of shit but it's in your mind that there's 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 world championships on the line even like say if you knew nothing about boxing and someone said to you there's going to be this world champion fight this world champion the storyline and the narrative is just so much more interesting (laughs) than just watching the next contender fight for the next fight the champion for his belt like in the ufc you just have the next contender that's going to fight the champion the next contender that's going to fight the champion but in boxing, you've got these, like, for me personally, like, a lot of people, like, the WBO was never recognised as a world title since like, until, like, the early 2000s, late 1990s. And it's, I think the IBO title is a world title, personally. Like, you've been, like, I don't think, I think they should make a stand and promoters like Eddie Hearn and Bob Ammon and Frank Warren, Al Heyman, these guys should really be pushing for that to be a world championship in its own right. Because you have certain promoters on one hand be, like, it's not a world title, but then one of the champions is holding that version of the belt and saying, my, my fight is a, he holds four world titles. But on one hand, you're saying it's not a world title. And on the other hand, you're saying your fighter holds four world titles, five world titles, three world titles, two world titles, whatever. Um, so I think just the narrative is better. That's why I think boxing shows a lot more. Like, let me have a look on my phone. Like you, you can, you can, people can go into Instagram and kind of check themselves. So if you go to say like, I don't know, uh, John Jones, kind of his Instagram page and you go to like I don't know AJ's or you go to Canelo's and that the box always has more yeah no, it's just because there's more eyes on the sport that's just what it is and it makes it more interesting that there's many different angles I mean with UFC like I don't know. Like they're, 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 to be fair I just think UFC is going to be wrestling in a few years I think all the strikers are going to go they're going to have a lot of European fighters, a lot of fighters from like that kind of Russian region. It's just going to be a lot of wrestling. Well, and Garnu wants to transition into boxing as well now because he's become this star power and he sort of wants to get out of that sort of environment and go into boxing. Because be interesting he because he's always, he's, he, yeah, he's got ground game, but his, his that kind of upbringing in the sport was striking, wasn't it? Mm-hmm. Okay, Masvidal's another one. Don't let his defeats deceive you, man. Like you go, what, you go back in time and watch his backyard fights in Kimbo Slice's house, like, fuck me, like, he, that boy can't bang, like, God knows why he didn't take up boxing, like, just boxing, because, like, you watch his fight against, like, Darren Till or uh, a couple of other ones, and just his head movement, his body movement, his, the way he strings shots together, even against, like, Nate Diaz and stuff, forget the kicks, which is the punches and stuff, I don't know why he never transitioned into boxing either, uh, they they both could have made a lot of money and, 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 done, and done pretty well, like, they're stars of their own right, and I hope Gengarnu does transition into boxing, because that, you get a lot of joke fights like McGregor transitioning into boxing was that was purely just for the money and I'm sorry but he he that was against a semi-perfect Floyd like a Floyd that had just maybe trained a couple of times yeah 
Ian Well. That wasn't a calculated performance. Like he he didn't calculate like he didn't systematically beat Conor McGregor like he beat Canelo or like he beat uh Marquez or Hatton or whoever. He put on a show. You know what I mean? He walked forward with his hands up and just punched him till he fell on the floor. Like that, that was his tactic. But you know I feel I mean? like that's another good example. Conor McGregor basically like was almost bigger than the UFC. He was their biggest star by a country mile. And yet his thing, actually, I was going to say that was his biggest payday, but obviously it's Floyd Mayweather. Ben Askren said that during this weekend, he got paid more against Jake Paul, a YouTuber in a fucking bullshit fucking boxing match than he ever got paid by the UFC. How, like, I, I just don't understand it. There must be stuff in place in it. Like I, I don't kind of like, unless I know something or someone in there or something about the business, I don't really like to comment on it because <laughs> us just being fans of sport, you don't know what's going on in the background. It's easy to jump on a bandwagon like everybody else and be like, oh, yeah, they should get paid the same. But there's a reason they're not getting paid the same. I don't yeah. exactly know what that reason is, but I'm sure Dana White knows. I'm sure that's, if it was that much of an issue, he would have hyped prices up and he would have um, kind of, paid his fighters more but I feel, I feel like it's probably better for like some of the lower like uh style fighters because they'll be getting paid more than they would but then at, that that's comp like that compromise has to be reached by the bigger fighters being yeah. paid less than they were which i guess for the overall sport as mma fair enough but then it's like it, it, that argument of like the, the stars will never be as big as the stars in boxing but the lower like league fighters i guess uh will obviously be big, bigger in, uh, in MMA. You know what it is? That's I kind of think that's the kind of the ego's talking as well. When was the last time you had a Bellator champion complain about his first? Yeah, true. Yeah, true. But apparently other other promotions pay better. So uh, f- from what I've been told from this MMA fighter from New York, he said one championship pays their fighters better than UFC. Obviously, I, I haven't looked into the numbers, so I can't really comment on that. But that's what that's what he was saying. Yeah, but there you go. It is maybe it's just an ego thing. You never know. You don't know. Like, you don't know I, unless you know like the ins and outs of what's going on. I don't think really it's fair to comment on on that kind of situation. Like John Jones yeah. knows what what he's doing. I don't know. I think maybe may, has has McGregor ever complained about his purses? Maybe <laughs> he's actually since Floyd. <laughs> no, but even prior to that, like maybe once. Yeah. yeah. Complained like a lot. Khabib ever complain about his? No. Adesanya, no, don't, 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 don't read. It's a lot of fighters are dumb, isn't it? It just makes me think there's a lot of ego involved, but but know your worth. And then some, sometimes it's just a hoax, isn't it? Sometimes you just push and push and push and push and push and push. Like maybe John Jones is trying to push for more money because I don't know. I, this is not me saying then Golden is going to beat him, but he, it, it might happen. You never know. Mm. Yeah, I mean, yeah, highly unlikely, but it might. You know, and maybe John Jones don't want to fight no more. He wants to one more big payday. Like, there's loads of stuff. To, I'm not saying any of either of those is true, but you never know, do you? Unless you know the ins and outs of something, you don't really know how to gauge it. Very, very true. I've really enjoyed this podcast. And uh, at the end of each podcast, what I like to do is uh, do some quick fire questions. So it's the same five questions as to every single guest. Um, and yeah, we'll just get straight into them. Is The first one is what are you most proud of? I don't know. It's not really quick fire questions. <laughs> Lot to be proud of. Um, for myself personally, it's just um, increasing my confidence to speak to people. I guess in myself, that's the most. That's what I'm proud of the most. Sick. Uh, number two is what are you most looking forward to? Next time I don't have to quarantine that fight. <laughs> fight card. Oh, I ruined that being in prison, man. <laughs> yeah. um, what is your biggest motivation? It's going to sound bad if I say money, but no, it's, it's, it's pride, I guess. It's pride, pride. And money. And money. <laughs> Money's not a bad thing, man. I, I say it to everybody, like, if it is what it is, do you know what I mean? It is what, uh, you can buy other things that will make you happy or, like, look after your family or and things like that. So um, what is your definition of success? <laughs> money. <laughs> nah, it's, it's, you know what, it's a bit, I don't want to say I want to walk down the street and people know who I am, but it's like, I want to be able to walk into a fight event with a fighter and and to that kind of, you know what? No, no, let me start again. My version of success is if I am involved with someone who makes it, that's it. My success comes from someone else's success. It doesn't come from me. 
Sweet. And uh, last but not least, because it's the Culture Cast podcast, how do you think your culture has affected you in your journey thus far? I personally think people might not see it now, and I don't want to sound big headed, but you don't see many Sikh guys, Sikh girls, Hindu guys, Hindu girls, like from our region of the world out there in a sport like boxing, doing media and stuff. I don't think, I, IFL don't, seconds out don't, fight hype don't, fight hub don't. <sighs> Anybody else I've got. I think Boston Social do. Um, but it's a, basically 90% of like media outlets uh, don't have an Asian face or an Indian face. And I'm proud to say I'm one of the only ones. Smashed it. Yeah, it's affected me. It's affected everything in, a, in in the right way. I make it strides in my own way. Definitely. And that's what we like to see, breaking barriers. Um, yeah, perfect. That, that, that's been a, the Coach Cast podcast for this week. Is there anything that you want to plug before we, we finish? <laughs> yeah, nah, man. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it, man. I enjoyed the chit chat. And if you don't follow Behind the Gloves, head over to YouTube and click subscribe. I'll, uh, I'll put that link in the description. I'll put Blue Corner Boxing on Instagram in the description as well. If you have Blue Corner Boxing on Instagram, drop me a message. I respond to everyone. Wicked. Uh, and he does. He responded to me. So uh, <laughs> he definitely does. Um...